Okay, I think we'll get started. Uh, welcome everyone. My name is Jo Brislane and I'm the Acting Director of Prevention in Action at Our Watch. I'd like you to welcome all of you to this webinar, Leading the Prevention of Violence Against Women in Local Government. This webinar is aimed at local government councillors and executive staff who have the opportunity to lead initiatives to prevent violence against women in their communities. I'd like to acknowledge the Australian Local Government Association, ALGA, for partnering in the delivery of this webinar, as well as the eight state and territory uh, local government associations who are working with Our Watch to better coordinate national primary prevention activity across the local government sector. We're also grateful to the Commonwealth Department of Social Services for funding this initiative. Before we begin today, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm coming to you from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation who have never ceded their sovereignty and very sincerely pay my respects to Aboriginal elders past and present, as well as acknowledging any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who might be joining us today. Our Watch acknowledges the decades long work and advocacy of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in working to prevent and address violence against Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women. I'd also like to recognise that many of us here today have been touched in some way by violence against women, and as always, remind everyone to please take care of yourselves today and remember to reach out to 1-800-RESPECT if any issues come up for you or those that you care for. Many of you will have attended a number of webinars before. And, um, for those of you who haven't though, I just wanna briefly explain how this will work. The only people who will have their cameras on and will be able to uh, be seen or recorded are myself and the other panelists who will be joining us today. As you see, there's an Auslan interpreter who will be with us for the whole hour today, as well as closed captions. If you need access to the closed captions, you can select the closed caption function at the bottom of your screen. A recording of today's webinar, including these accessibility aspects will be available on our Watch's website in the coming weeks. You can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask questions of the panelists at the appropriate time and your question will only be visible to everyone once we've answered it, but that will come through to us. We'll be sharing links and additional information in the chat, and please only use the chat to introduce yourself and tell us where you're coming today from today, and please feel free to do that as you like. We'll start now with a brief introduction to primary prevention, and then hear from our guest speaker and panelists about the role local government can play in the primary prevention of violence against women. I'll jump back in now and give a really brief overview of primary prevention and how it links to the local government sector before I pass over and introduce our panellists and pass over to our key speaker for today. So I just want to start by sharing this image that you see on screen and just, and just foregrounding that primary prevention, as we know, is about what the work that aims to stop the violence against women from occurring in the first place. So to stop it before it starts, as we often hear. It's work to change the deep-seated drivers of this violence and the underlying social conditions in which that happens. So while there is a strong connection to work in other places in this pyramid that you see, and in such as response and early intervention, this work is uh, distinct in the sense that it tries to address the underlying drivers of violence. Historically, there's been many attempts to understand violence against women. And some have sought simplistic or single cause factors. And it's really important to say that when we're talking about those underlying drivers, what we mean is trying to impact the enabling environment around with, uh, that sits around a person who might choose to use violence. And what that means is that all of us in our relationships, in our conversations, in our communities, in the organisations in which we work, have a power to shift that environment, to shift the norms, structures and practices that exist that might make it more likely, for example, for violence against women to occur. Australia's shared framework for the prevention of violence against women and their children, Change the Story, identifies four key drivers of violence against women called the gendered drivers, and you can see those on screen right now. It also recognises that the social context in which gen uh, violence against women occurs has a big impact. And so we need, if we are going to address violence against women, we need to address these gendered drivers, but we also need to think about other intersecting forms of discrimination and oppression. These drivers that you see, condoning of violence against women, men's control of decision making and limits to women's independence, rigid gender stereotypes and dominant forms of masculinity, and male peer relations and cultures of masculinity that emphasise aggression, dominance and control show up in our everyday lives in many different ways. 
They show up where people live, learn, work and socialise. And I would expect with a, an audience like this that I don't need to tell you what a role local government has in the places where people live, learn, work and socialise. And so summing up more quickly than intended with that, I'll pass you over now to our key speaker, Senator Linda Scott. We're now going to hear about the role of local government leaders in primary prevention from our keynote speaker, Councillor Linda Scott. Linda is currently serving as president of the Australian Local Government Association. She is also currently serving as a councillor on the City of Sydney Council and as chair of Super Care Super, an award-winning industry superannuation fund. Linda is passionate about the primary prevention of violence against women and children, and as ALGA president, has the opportunity to represent local government views on this issue and more. On the National Reform Federal Council with the Prime Minister, Premiers and Treasurers, the National Joint Council on Closing the Gap, the Commonwealth Government's Regional Banking Task Force and other intergovernmental fora. Welcome, Linda, and thank you so much for being here today. Thanks so much, Joanna, and to your team for not only hosting today's forum, but managing all the technical difficulties that we've all experienced over the last few years. Uh, I'm very honoured to be asked to speak today about this critically important subject. And before I start, I would like to acknowledge that I'm here today in my own local government area in the city of Sydney. And so I'm on the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. Uh, thank you so much to our watch uh, for the great partnership that we have developed. Uh, one of the results, of course, of the partnership between our watch and the Australian Local Government Association that I have the honour of being the president of is uh, this seminar where we have committed to working together to do more about uh, the prevention of violence against women. And I want to say from the outset uh, that uh, I believe as councillors, as members of uh, the local government family, we all have a responsibility to do everything we can to remove the insidious problem of domestic violence and abuse. There is no level of government uh, which this sits with. It's everybody's clear responsibility. Uh, and of course, that includes raising awareness of the impact as well as support for those who are experiencing this horrendous violence. It's untenable that we have each week in Australia, one woman die as a result of domestic violence. Uh, these are, of course, our mothers, our grandmothers, our sisters, our friends, uh, and it must stop. Being at the heart of communities, local government really is the ideal setting to ensure more support is provided for the prevention of domestic violence. Across the nation, local government provides more than 150 services to our communities. We employ just under 200,000 Australians. Our communities look to us for leadership. And that's why, as local governments, we do have a critical role in starting the conversation and modelling the positive initiatives in our own councils and in our own communities. Elected councillors and local government staff all live in their local areas. In many cases, we are the closest point, and indeed, in some cases, the only point of contact in a community between residents and governments. And as community leaders, of course, it's why we should start by getting our own house in order, uh, our own ability for councils to improve gender equity through our own workplace policies and cultures and practices. As one of the largest employers in Australia, and indeed, particularly in regional Australia, the largest employer in many regions across the nation, Building skills and awareness across all areas of local government can, of course, lead to clear positive impacts in our communities. Strong leadership by mayors and councillors committing a council to take action is a thing that can make a real difference. So for all of you today who are elected, 
uh, I urge you, if your local government has not, to move a motion to make a commitment to reducing domestic violence and to be uh, and show and live that leadership uh, for prevention in your daily interactions with your residents and your businesses. Sadly, like any employer, we know that uh, our own staff and indeed even our own elected officials can be affected by domestic and family violence. Um, a big part of my job is talking to uh, mayors and elected representatives regularly. And whilst of course I would never identify them, I certainly have been um, approached by members even of uh, elected councils uh, to share their experiences with me. Uh, so we all know this cuts across all sections of society. Uh, I personally have seen this in local government. Uh, in my own state of New South Wales, uh, we were really excited to see a resolution come from a council to our annual conference in 2019 to urge local governments to um, uh, allow all council employees in New South Wales, more than 45,000 people, to um, be allowed to have 10 days paid leave to deal with the possible effects of domestic and family violence. Uh, I know that in Queensland, local governments have similar provisions and in Victoria, most councils have 20 days paid leave. This paid leave is so significant because of course it enables women impacted by violence to make the necessary arrangements, perhaps to move house or to seek further family support without the added burden of worrying about losing employment uh, or about financial strain. If your local government or your state or territory doesn't have provision uh, in your local government employment conditions for people to access leave, I encourage you to take that up with your state or territory association. We know that council facilities and services too are of course used by people in the community. Councils can influence gender equity and inclusion in our planning and the delivery of our facilities, our libraries, our sporting grounds, our playgrounds, our kindergartens, our parks and our swimming pools, our caravan parks and social and welfare services. Uh, I can't think of a local government and I include my own in this that doesn't have a set of sporting facility change rooms where uh, there's not um, more men's toilets than women's uh, or there's not even women's toilets available. We all have them. So there is absolutely um, more that we can do to promote gender equity in every part of our local government planning. Um, and I know you're all after this um, think about the resolutions that you can move to see that progress if you're an elected member. But uh, finally, I'd like to refer you, if you haven't seen it already, to the Domestic Violence Local Government Toolkit. Uh, for those that haven't seen it, it's a simply fantastic resource, a valuable guide developed specifically for councils. And today's webinar is an additional resource to assist councils in implementing the toolkit. ALGA is very proud to continue to uh, work with our watch to seek funding to help councils progress domestic violence prevention measures, because uh, we know that funding uh, is a barrier but even without funding, small measures um, that you can learn more about in the toolkit can make a really big difference. I've already talked about uh, some of those measures, building the skills and knowledge in the workforce and putting a gender lens over our services and infrastructure, for example, but there are so many other opportunities. Uh, in my council, again, in the city of Sydney, we put messages about the prevention of violence on our rubbish trucks that drive throughout the city streets every day. People can use their mayoral or councillor columns to raise awareness of the issue in your communities. Talk to local media about your personal strong views about the need to address this problem. Outline your council's position on this issue in speeches when you're perhaps welcoming new Australian citizens and talking about your personal commitment.
Um, and I'll leave you with what I think is one of those completely uh, inspirational statements. All 77 of Queensland's mayors have pledged their support to the campaign, not in our backyard. Uh, to me, that's extremely impressive that the 77 mayors have made um, a very strong joint commitment to stand together and to do everything they can to prevent uh, violence against women. It's so magnificent to see this leadership. It demonstrates the dedication of our councils, but also we hope the power of councils to drive change at the local level to see less violence and we hope uh, less deaths of women from domestic assaults and violence in our community. Thank you again for uh, hanging on with us through the technical problems uh, and I look forward to hearing the contributions from the other speakers today. Thank you so much, Linda. It's so clear your passion for this issue and so great to hear some of those very practical tips that you have for other councillors and people in local government who might want to start, you know, pushing against uh, for this issue in their own local government. So appreciate your time today. Today we have four representatives from councils across the country who are here to share their experiences of leading political and cultural support for primary prevention. So I'd just like to introduce them now before we uh, pass some questions to the panel. Ali Wasty is the CEO of Basco Shire Council in Victoria. Ali is passionate about using her position to improve gender equity in the organisation and the communities that she serves. Ali has led a number of landmark reforms to promote gender equality in the workplace at Bass Strait Council, including paid parental leave of 16 weeks for all staff, regardless of their gender, superannuation for workers on parental leave and gender equality action plans as part of all leaders' professional development plans. Ali, thank you for being here today. Councillor Romola Hollywood is from Blue Mountain City Council in New South Wales. Councillor Hollywood was first elected to Blue Mountain City Council in 2012 and is now serving as the Deputy Mayor. Councillor Hollywood championed the development of her council's gender equity strategy, which was launched in 2021, and also has extensive professional experience in social policy and advocacy roles, including in the area of domestic and family violence. Welcome, Romola. Councillor Arman Ibrahim, Ibrahim Zadeh is the Deputy Lord Mayor in the City of Adelaide in South Australia. He's also an ambassador for Our Watch. Arman became an anti-domestic violence campaigner after losing his mother to domestic violence in March 2010. Together with his sisters, Atina and Anita, in 2015 they founded Zara Foundation Australia in their mum's honour, an organisation that provides financial literacy and economic empowerment for women, women fleeing abusive homes. Welcome, Arman. Thank you for being here today. And finally, Councillor Chantelle Stone is from the city of Cockburn in Perth, Western Australia. Chantelle has a strong interest in family and domestic violence and women's issues and is the current pres president of the WA branch of the Australian Local Government's Women's Association. So starting off with our Q&A today, I'd like to throw a question to everyone on the panel. I'll start with Ali Wasty and then go to Romola, Arman and Chantelle. What has been your journey to prevention work and making the decision to be a champion for change? Yeah, great oh. question. Great question. Thank you. Um, my journey to prevention work began around about 10 years ago. Um, before commencing in local government, I really wasn't aware that gender inequality is the primary reason for violence against women. And in fact, I actually didn't give it much of a thought. And that's probably down to my own ignorance and also privilege. Um, so initially, when I started in local government, I worked on initiatives such as preventing violence against women through initial awareness raising campaigns, such as like the 16 days of activism, and got to work with some great advocates inside and outside lo the local government sector. I've partnered with groups such as Women for Gippsland, and I cannot shout about how great it is an opportunity to really partner with some um, community groups who understand the nuances of each community that we find ourselves in. Um, and really got behind campaigns such as like the Put Her Name On It campaign, where as a local government sector, we can really do a lot. So for example, uh, across Australia and certainly indeed in Victoria, women uh, are acknowledged on less than 3% of um, places. So roads, sporting facilities, uh, community houses, you name it. 
only about 3% of these kinds of facilities that is the domain of local government are named after women. So really get getting behind uh, uh, campaigns that have got a lot of local momentum. Organising International Women's Days and bringing out keynote speakers. So in, in that sort of high profile uh, awareness raising opportunities to do so in the workplace and really encourage conversations with everyone. They're really important, but they're certainly uh, not only what we can do. So at Bass Coast, we hold regular forums and discussions deliberately outside International Women's Day. Of course, we do a lot then, but we make sure that we are having this conversation every day at work. So gender equality and our gender equality action plans is actually a component of everybody's PDP at Bass Coast Shire Council. So that means that we're impacting 450 people in conversations um, when we can and as often as we can. Other things that we've done is actually uh, do a number of landmark decisions um, and moves. And for example, sporting groups that want to use our facilities must offer equal prize money. Uh, so we've had a number of conversations with different groups who've said, and, and you know what, they don't even think about it. It's only until they're challenged to say, well, how about you offer equal prize money? And more often than not, they say, yeah, we should have thought about that. So it's just the questioning um, that can uh, create change. So I'd also like to acknowledge Surfing Victoria and the World Cross uh, Moto, um, Motorsport as well, because they were the first uh, group in Victoria and also Australia and around the world to um, offer equal prize money, because we made a commitment that if they were to use our facilities, that they must have that. So now they've just put that as part of their policy and practice. In Victoria as well, we are required to submit gender equality action plans. So that's for the whole of local government. So we have our Commission for Gender Equality and that's incredibly powerful. Uh, so every single local government entity and also public sector entity is required by law to submit those gender equality action plans. So we're seeing a lot more, uh, but certainly we've got a lot more to do as well. Thanks so much, Ellie. Romola, I'll pass over to you next. Thanks very much. And um, I really thank uh, Our Watch for um, hosting this webinar and actually bringing this um, conversation to light and enabling councils to feel that they can network and really recognise the difference that we can make. And I'd also like to um, acknowledge uh, all of the, tra uh, the traditional owners on the lands that we're meeting today um, through this Zoom. And I'd also like to pay tribute to the strength and courage of survivors of domestic and family violence and sexual violence. Um, and I also hold in my heart um, those women um, who've died at the hands of perpetrators of domestic and family violence. We know that this violence has to stop and um, there are many threads to being able to take that action um, for change. So my, my particular journey around the prevention work um, has many threads and probably the first one is that I'm actually a woman and um, I <laughs> care about what actually happens to, to, um, for women like myself and, and others. But it's also been informed by my professional experience in social policy and advocacy, um, particularly in the space around um, child and women's safety. And I, I very much back in the um, uh, public health model that you uh, put up at the beginning and the fact that it is a multi-layered approach and a whole of community approach. Um, the other thread that I had was as a councillor, uh, when I ran for election in 2012, I actually found that I was the only woman elected to the governing body. And that was quite a shock because our community, I think, is fairly um, progressive. And a lot of men said to me, how did that happen? Like, where, why aren't there more women on council? And so, you know, you can take your eye off the ball on gender equity and suddenly, you know, things can unravel or we can have surprises. So, um, so but that was quickly rectified in by-elections, two women were elected. And I think that uh, that was a very st strong message that the community wanted gender equity on the governing body. 
and I'm pleased to say we now have um, six uh, female councillors on um, on Blue Mountain City Council. So um, you know, there's the progress there. But the other part to the equation was really just becoming incredibly curious about how women were going in our community. Um, we held, uh, we've been holding a white ribbon breakfast for uh, many years and um, each year we would read out the stats both in our local community and statewide and nationally and you could see that things just weren't changing. So for me, um, I really thought, well, are we doing enough just with a breakfast and um, talked with my colleagues um, and the mayor and um, brought forward, as, as Linda <laughs> Scott has said, brought forward a notice of motion to start that process around what could we do to improve the status of women, to actually put a spotlight on it. And um, that uh, evolved into our council being one of a handful in New South Wales uh, that has a gender, a formal gender equity strategy. So that's my journey. That's great. Thank you so much, Romola, for sharing. Arman, I'll pass over to you now with that same question of what has been your journey towards prevention work and making the decision to champion this work. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, well, I guess my journey started about 34 years ago when I was born into a family with rigid um, uh, structures and uh, gender stereotypes. Um, I was essentially raised in a, um, in a family home where violence and abuse was uh, quite normal and quite frequent. Um, the perpetrator of this violence was always my dad. Uh, and unfortunately, we all copped it, whether it was myself, uh, I've got two sisters, and I had my mum in the family home. So. Um, uh, things unfortunately got to a stage where uh, we were threatened to be killed in our family home and um, we had uh, no other option but to leave that family home in order to stay safe. Uh, so when we talk about this uh, broad spectrum of violence and abuse, um, uh, unfortunately my family and I were, uh, uh, you know, we witnessed it all and we experienced it all, whether if it was controlling or manipulative behaviour, whether if it was financial abuse, uh, emotional or psychological abuse, physical abuse, um, right down to uh, threats to harm and threats to kill. Um, unfortunately, our journey uh, took us out of our family home and made us homeless. So our family car became our, uh, our family home. We uh, faced poverty uh, and we were also uh, isolated from, uh, from our community. Um, uh, uh, it was about 12 months after that incident that uh, at that point when we left our family home that uh, my dad uh, tracked down my mum and, and killed her in, in quite a public setting. Uh, and I guess I fell in this uh, sector by default. Um, uh, and that's when uh, my journey in the um, uh, prevention space really started. Uh, as, as you heard earlier uh, in the introduction, um, in 2015, we established a, uh, a not-for-profit, a charity called the Zara Foundation. And we aim to uh, 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 financially empower women uh, through that foundation. And it was about a month ago that we actually um, announced uh, that our service was going to go nationwide. So uh, we've been operating for close to seven years here in South Australia, but we're uh, um, uh, taking that service uh, nationally um, later this year. Uh, so really, that's um, that's my journey in a, in a nutshell, and uh, I'm hoping that uh, through local government, I can, uh, um, uh, I guess, uh, influence more change and uh, and talk about the um, the impacts that family and domestic violence can have. Uh, the um, uh, a lot of the impacts that um, people don't see just because uh, the tragedies happen behind closed doors. So I'm hoping to sh shed a light on that. Thank you so much, Arman. And it's a stark reminder, I think, that for many people, this work is not conceptual. It is absolutely about something that, you know, is very personal. Um, and I think I really appreciate you sharing that story today. I'll just pass over finally to Chantelle before we move on to our next question. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Look, I really echo the sentiments of the fellow panellists. My story into the journey um, of prevention work actually starts just like Arman's. I grew up with domestic violence in my home. So from that, I understand the triggers, the trauma, 
the feeling of isolation, the entrapment that domestic violence brings for families and for, for women. As a, as a kid, I remember protecting my brother and having to shield him and take him away from the danger whenever the yelling started and abuse was happening. And later, when I had moved out and had a safe space for us both, I went back and rescued him. But I guess the reason and the, the moment that I really decided to be a champion for change was the day that I walked into a police station and reported my dad for the abuse. From that time, I've always championed change for women. During my first election campaign in 2017, I, along with several other female candidates in the area, was subject to extreme levels of gender bias and gender-based bullying um, and a lot of harassment on social media. And I'm sure a lot of the councillors watching will be very familiar with what that feels like. I was taunted about my personal life, um, especially things about my children, um, about I was called ugly names because my children have different fathers. And there were some people even implying that I was going to neglect my children by standing on council. And what would happen to my children? Someone think of the kids. It was really awful. I was being judged by people that I didn't know. They didn't know me. They'd never met us. They didn't know my situation. However, from all of my experiences through my very difficult childhood, I've built a pretty strong tolerance and level of resilience. So despite the amount of bullying, I was still able to push forward, but not everyone was as resilient as I am. And it did impact a lot of fellow colleagues that were running. So really when it's talking about change, I wanted to make sure that no other woman had to experience the torment and harassment that I did when I was running for election. I didn't want others to feel lonely and feel the isolation and all of those triggers that happen when you're being targeted. We need women to stand up and be representational. We need women leadership to break down the barriers of domestic violence, but we need to clear the pathway to allow them to step up into those leadership roles. So for me, I joined the Australian Local Government Women's Association and we formed a really supportive team to make sure that no other woman would have to go through that when they're running for election. We're really interested in making a difference and clearing that way. And as we have stepped up, we want to help the next lot step up and clear the way for them to move forward. Thank you so much, Chantelle. Really appreciate, again, you sharing your story and also you know, acknowledging how important it is for us to look at the broader organisational change that is needed to ensure women are more safe and more welcome to enter into leadership positions. Um, I'm just going to throw now to uh, individual panel members to ask some questions. And just because we've had some technical difficulties early on, we're a little behind time. So just flagging, um, if you can keep your answers to a couple of minutes, it means that we then have some time for those in attendance today to ask their questions. So Aman, I'll ask you first, what do you think are the key benefits to local government of undertaking primary prevention work? Um, so I think uh, um, Councillor Linda Scott uh, highlighted this perfectly in terms of local government being the first point of contact between people and any tier of government. Uh, I certainly uh, feel that here in South Australia. Uh, and uh, I guess by that you have a, um, uh, a, a grassroots movement uh, where uh, you're talking to uh, individuals, um, uh, precinct groups uh, and, and uh, community groups. Um, <clears throat> so once that happens, uh, I guess you, um, you, can, you can show the other tiers of government, state government and, and federal government, uh, that uh, the local government sector is doing something about uh, this issue. Uh, so you are showing leadership and I guess you can use that to your advantage to, to um, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of, to drag state government and federal government uh, into, into playing uh, their roles in this space. Um, uh, South Australia, the, the way local government works in, in South Australia is um, 
uh, quite unique. We have a, uh, a niche role. So a lot of the work that's, uh, um, uh, that's based around uh, primary prevention or the crisis work uh, falls with state government and federal government. Uh, but I guess the more that we can raise awareness, uh, the more we can uh, uh, get um, uh, the local community uh, to be aware of such issues and, and I guess engage with their uh, uh, local state MP and uh, local federal MP, uh, chances are the more results we're going to have. So. Uh, I think that's uh, that's probably the, the most important thing about local government is that grassroots um, a connection and movement. Fantastic, thank you, Amran. The next question I'll pass to Ali. Councils are community leaders, but they're also workplaces, as your previous work, Ali, has recognised. How yeah. have you led primary prevention in your workplace, and what does this require? It requires leadership and it requires courage uh, because what we're doing is transformational. So. Um, just today, actually, I've got an op-ed in the Herald Sun, Victoria's Herald Sun, where it highlights our work that we've done, which is a landmark decision around uh, paid parental leave, so not distinguishing between um, genders. Uh, you get 16 weeks paid parental leave, um, and we also have backed that up with a year's superannuation so that's also uh, regardless of we, regardless whether you are a primary or secondary carer, the cost to the organisation to do this, and I'm often asked this, is sixty thousand dollars. That's for Bass Coast. Obviously, it'd be different for all local government authorities. The cost of not doing it will play it out, out, out in our community, and we will not see gender equality in our lifetime. We will not see um, superannuation, gender equality in our lifetime. I um, put forward, you know, it's an opportunity. I want to see every local government not only match what Bass Coast have done, but go better. So if we can inspire others to do so, and it's not hard. We are at the level, uh, we can do this. Uh, it didn't require sign off by another level of government. This is just the will. At Bass Coast, we have a gender pay gap of around about 3%. The only reason why we have that gender cap pay gap is because women are women and men are men. Across Australia, it's over 15%. So we know that each year, uh, women have to work two and a half more months each year just to get the same pay as men, because women are women. And the um, intersectionality of that obviously is worse. So women of colour, women who identify as LGBTQI+, it'll be worse. We can take this opportunity. So I implore all leaders here, all councillors to have the conversation. What has been a little disheartening is um, some comments from leaders in the sector say, oh, we'd like to do it, but the system doesn't allow us. It means that we'll have to spend another hour processing payroll. Well, and until your systems catch up, that's okay. Spend that hour because the difference that we can make on the primary prevention is huge. And I just believe it is our role and it's something that I'm really passionate about. Thanks, Joanna. Thank you so much, Ellie. Um, I'm now gonna to pass to Robola and ask, where do you think local governments can have their biggest impact in relation to prevention, Robola? Uh, sorry, just um, unmuting myself and I've got a... Um, dialogue box that I'm not sure what that is. <laughs> okay, um, in terms of uh, impact, I mean, I, I pay tribute to uh, the um, comments that Linda Scott made around like the, the diversity of areas that you can um, have impact on. And I think, um, as Ali said, putting a, um, a spotlight on various processes, practices, systems and policies, um, can really uh, make a difference. I guess um, for me, and I think Amon has said this as well, the, um, the fact that we are the, the tier of government closest to the community. I mean, one of the things that I, I very much hope with our gender um, equity strategy is that we keep a spotlight on the issues. And um, one of the things that I wanna see is, is um, reporting, regular reporting on how we're actually going. So, so our gender equity strategy um, is available on Blue Mountain City Council's website. And we've also set up a, web, a, a separate website 
um, uh, highlighting, you know, much more accessible for the community to just see what gender um, equity really means. But I think being able to look at a range of actions, but also how we're delivering on those actions is, is really important. So I just wanted to tease out two things. One is working um, great impact in terms of councils being able to work with the local community organisations, particularly um, or community organisations that are actually working in the space of prevention themselves. So examples are um, we, our Zonta group in the Blue Mountains, our Blue Mountains Women's Health Centre and our neighbourhood centres. So being able to work collaboratively and collectively to strengthen and support their work, not take it over, but just be able to, to link up and network and um, really drive some change at a, at a community-based level. And the other thing which I think has been touched on is, is the fact that councils are large employers and in rural and re regional areas, and, and our council is um, no different, uh, we are actually the largest employer. So we do need to have um, good, strong gender equity policies and strategies in terms of how we support our workforce. The other thing is that council's workforce is diverse. And we also have a number of um, areas where there are um, traditionally, you know, masculinized areas of work and feminized areas of work. And so how council can actually bring that um, forward is um, and start to address that. You, we have, um, you know, we're very lucky. We have a, um, a female CEO. We have um, a number of our executive team are also um, women. So we're doing we're doing well at that level. But but we also need to. We can't be complacent. So the key things I think is that um, when you put a spotlight on um, gender equity and you start looking at the data and measuring it it's an opportunity for change. And the other aspect is um, in terms of being able to um, bring the community along with us and have that community voice, I think is really um, critical as well. So, and we've done a bit of work supporting community organisations in the um, area of, of saying no to violence um, in our community in the Blue Mountains. Thanks so much, Ramla. I think particularly that reminder about accountability is something that's really, really important in this work. I'm just going to pass now to Chantal with a final question and then we will pick up any questions that have come up in the chat. So if anybody would like to ask something, just a reminder that you can pop that in the Q&A function. Chantal, I just wanted to ask, we know that increasing representation of women in leadership is a really important thing to promote gender equity and prevent violence. Why do you think women's leadership in local government is important in the context of preventing violence against women? Thank you so much for this question. Uh, look, domestic violence really, and preventing domestic violence starts with changing gender bias, right? If society does not see women in positions of power, they start to think that only men can be leaders. So then it, re it leads to women only being less likely to pursue those leadership roles. And as Linda said earlier, communities look to us for leadership. So we need to really change that dialogue. We need to change and highlight the amazing job that women are doing. Across Australia, the female representation on councils is approximately 38.3%. So we still have a lot of work to do nationally to reach gender gen equity on council. And that's just on council. That's not even looking at within the city executive and within the CEOs. We need to encourage more women to run for council, but to do that, we have to understand what are those barriers that are preventing them from standing. And a lot of research has been done into this to identify those barriers. And a lot of them actually have a lot of synergies with domestic violence. Things like the perception of the role of women, lack of resources and finances, self-confidence, access to networks, lack of role models. You know, there's so many synergies between the two. So what we've done here in WA through the Local Government Women's Association, we created a program called Standing Up 
to help support and lift women that were running for council in the last election in 2021. And we went through and did a whole bunch of programs trying to encourage more women to stand, but also giving them, breaking down those barriers. So we created a guide to help them to run for council. We created a support network online and we've started to break down those barriers one by one to help them to, to want to run. Now, as a result of that program, we actually saw an increase in female representation across WA. But one of the most encouraging signs of the last election is we actually saw more women standing up into leadership roles. So into those mayoral and deputy mayoral roles, which was absolutely fantastic. So now we have the job of having to highlight those achievements and to make sure that we are promoting the women in leadership roles so that we, again, get back to that eradicating gender bias and showing that women can be leaders. They can stand up and be mayors and deputy mayors and take on a, a high level of leadership in WA. Our peak body, Walga, has their president is a woman. So we want to make sure that we are highlighting the women in these leadership roles so that it becomes the norm. That is probably one of the biggest keys of things that we can do here in all local governments is celebrate each other and lift each other up so that it does change the dialogue. Thank you so much, Chantel. And I think it's really easy for us to talk in the prevention world and space about shifting the norms, structures and practices that lead to violence. But sometimes that just feels really up in the air and it doesn't you know make sense practically but hearing from all of you today for me it's just really clear that we're bringing that to life what does it look like to shift those norms around women's leadership and involvement in decision making what does it look like to think about the structures that exist in our workplaces and make them more equitable so thank you to all of you for your responses thus far a great question has come through from Alexandra Wyatt and she's asking, as a newly elected councillor in a community with high levels of domestic family violence and gender discrimination and a high level of dis disadvantage, including in education, what would you recommend as the first two steps that she can take in her role? So happy for anyone to pop your hand up and, and jump in. Um, what are those first two steps you can take in that circumstance? Ali? Oh yeah, sure. Um, I'm sure it doesn't say what council you're from, can, um, but whatever. I'm sure there are wonderful people and really talented and highly experienced people within your um, organisation that will have no doubt um, connection to your health and wellbeing plans and policy. So I, I, I'm sure that the teams would welcome a conversation with you and they can provide that guidance. And as a elected representative, your community and the community groups um, and connecting with them as um, uh, Councillor Hollywood said, um, is incredibly important too, because they've got, they're often got that lived experience um, and know how the systems work on the ground as well. So good luck in your endeavours. And also, I'd also like just to shout out as well. So happy to take that question offline um, as well. So drop me an email. Thank you. So I might add to that. Um, yeah, when please. I was first elected, it was nearly 10 years ago now. Um, it sounds like a funny thing to say, but a lot of the women's services um, were facing funding cuts. And so one of the things I did as a new councillor was just find out where the services were in my local government area and go and visit them and see what they did and just learn a bit more about um, how they operated and what they needed. Um, through doing that, and it is um, this is in New South Wales, so relevant for Kempsey, I learned that they were having troubles with um, the streams of state and federal funding um, and so we passed motions at the City of Sydney supporting their campaign to seek more funding um, and I'm sure those same needs are you know very um, urgent and present. I think the other thing you can do um, is to um, do a gender pay um, uh, audit of the council if one's not done. So again, I moved a motion and I've every organisation I've ever chaired, I've done this. Um, ask for reporting in your annual report of the um, gender pay gap that exists in your council. 
Um, and um, that, as Romola and others have highlighted, can really be a good trigger for um, systemic change and ensuring that staff are constantly thinking about who they're employing, what background they're from, what gender they are, um, and then you'll see that even that reporting starts to drive change over time. So they're the two things I'd probably do if I was you. Thanks so much, Linda. There's just one more question that's come through from Belinda. As a newbie to working in local government, this has been very insightful. So that's a compliment for a question. Um, is there a code of conduct for elected members? There is. Okay, we'll make sure, Belinda, that we um, send that link through to you um, after we've finished. And maybe if I can just pass to um, Romola or Chantelle or Arman, who didn't answer the question we just had, what do you think is uh, for, to finish us off uh, is somewhere that somebody can get started. So if there's just one thing that you think they can do, what would it be as a way to get started? Chantelle, I'll start with you. There's a couple of things. Um, firstly, join your local government women's association. There's literally one in every state. So come and join us and be a part of that movement. Um, you know, encourage more women to stand for local government. So identify your community leaders and help them up help them bring them up. Um, obviously, I, I love the fact that you guys in the East Coast have got gender equity um, strategies. We don't have one. I'm going to be putting a motion up to go in and start one. <laughs> you know, that's going to be something that I'm taking away from this. Um, so I think we've all got some actions that we can work on together. Um, but one of the other ones that I'd highly recommend is making gender equity a KPI for your CEO. No, you're a councillor, you have that power, let's consider using it. Fantastic. Roma, what would your advice be? Look, I think my advice would be for councillors, um, but also I think maybe some encouragement from, from the staff that are on, um, particularly if we've got CEOs or senior executive staff um, on, the, on the line as well, um, is to, to move, move a motion around um, calling for either a gender equity strategy, um, information, just calling for a report around the status of women um, and what statistics the, the, the council actually holds around how women are going. That can become a starting point for putting the spotlight on what might be the next steps. So that, that I think is um, a, a really concrete action. And it also, if you're calling simply for a, a report on um, uh, gender equality, what, what we know within your local government area, that can become a catalyst for um, conversations on the governing body at the, um, and the senior executive. So it might be that you develop a gender equity strategy. I also just wanted to, to encourage people that um, at the last local government New South Wales conference, um, our council brought forward a motion calling for New South Wales to do, um, calling on the New South Wales government to implement something similar to Victoria around a gender equality act, gender equity act, sorry. And the motion passed unanimously without any debate. So what that tells me is that we have actually come a long way in the last 10 years around being aware, particularly when we've seen the horrors at the, the federal in federal parliament, that we things are not okay and that we actually do need to, to make a start. So um, that's where I think feel confident, start having the conversations and also networking with your local community organisations working in this space. Thank you so much, Romola. And apologies, Armand, that I can't now throw to you. We've run out of time. Um, I'm sure you would have excellent advice for people. But I guess the, the key piece of advice is recognise that there are a lot of other people leading on this issue and championing this issue within your sector, within local government. And so if you are getting started, you know, there are people to reach out to who have very practical ideas, really great experience. And as from we can, what we can see today, are very willing to share about that. So thank you so much to all of our panellists from today and to our um, key speaker, Linda. Really, really appreciate your time. I just want to um, close off by reminding you again that there is the Prevention Toolkit for Local Government, which was shared in the chat earlier. 
um, that may support you in your work and also um, let you know about the next webinar, Councils and Communities, Local Government Supporting the Prevention of Violence Against Women, which will be taking place on the 8th of June, which is for local government employees working in community development and engagement, diversity and inclusion, health and wellbeing, community safety and communications and marketing roles. So we'll share a link in the chat to that now for those of you who might be interested yourselves or want to pass that on to others within your, your organisations. Um, we also ask that you complete a participant survey that will be emailed out to you following this session. So just a reminder that that always helps us improve these sessions for future and we'd really appreciate your time in filling that out. So thank you so much everyone for joining us and bearing with our early technical issues. And thank you again to our panellists and best of luck to all of you in all of your work supporting the prevention of violence against women.